not every cover crop out there can provide the same benefit. So if you're after fixing nitrogen, cereal rye is not what we use. But if you're after weed suppression and erosion control, it's a great option. So we start with the why, and then we follow up with what tools in the toolbox do you have? Welcome to Illinois Corn TV. My name is Megan DeWyer, and I'm the Director of Conservation and Nutrient Stewardship at Illinois Corn. On this show, we bring you informative ag interviews to position Illinois farmers to grow. We've broken this show up into two parts, so let's get started with part one. Our featured interview with Laura Lant. Laura is an agronomist at Midwest Grass and Forage. So this week, we really talked about a broad spectrum of things to make farmers successful. And I think Laura highlighted some great things about practice standards and what those mean for farmers that are thinking about programs. Also, the first questions that a farmer really should be thinking about if they're interested in starting to try cover crops on their own farm. So with that, let's jump into the interview. Hey, Laura. So we know Illinois farmers are really feeling the pressure about implementing things like cover crops and no-till, things like 40B, the Treasury announcement, the Endangered Species Act, nutrient laws, all of this is going on. So you as an agronomist and selling and dealing and working with cover crop seed every day, how are you helping farmers navigate this? What are the big things you're hearing and and helping them think about as they think about all these programs and, and what's out there? Absolutely. Well, there's always challenges every year that we have to deal with, and 2024 seems to be no exception to that rule. Um, Illinois farmers have a lot on their plate. There are so many different pieces to things we have to be keeping up with, and things are changing. I I look just in the short few years that I've been working with Midwest Grass, and some major, major changes have happened for us in this last farm bill, how much funding was there, and the programs that guys are eligible for. The crop insurance rules changed just a few years ago so that we can now have cover crops growing during the same period of time that the cash crop is. In the past, we had to terminate them prior to cash crop emergence. Um, Drone technology has continued to change and evolve, giving us another tool in the toolbox to get stuff established even quicker. So lots and lots of moving parts on the cover crop side that guys are having to pay attention to. My biggest message to everybody is just because your neighbor's doing it one way doesn't mean you have to do it the same way. Too too often, I think we look at what someone else is doing where we read an article and we think that's the only way to do it. And instead, there are so many options out here. And I really encourage everyone to take the time and find that advisor or that neighbor or friend with experience and talk to them one-on-one. Um, cover crops don't work the same for everybody because everybody has different soil types, different goals, different equipment. So making sure that you develop a plan that is tailored to you is probably my biggest takeaway to make sure that you have success. Now, let's move on to part two. Not okay. to be corny. I've got a joke for you. Are you ready? Sure. All right. Why did the farmer become an expert in conservation practices? Why did the farmer become an expert in conservation practices? You're going to have to tell me that one, Megan. Because he wanted to be a crop star and save the earth one field at a time. Very nice. Very nice. And now it's time for Just the Facts with Clay, brought to you by PCM. There's more to PCM than just the data reports and connections to programs. We pay farmers $750 to join, which is the value we provide until trend lines are established and we can begin making recommendations. We're also funded by the Illinois Corn Growers Association and the Illinois Soybean Association, So our data is being used to influence policymakers, advocate for the stewardship that farmers have already implemented, and drive practice incentive payments based on the bottom line difference between conservation practices compared to conventional practices. With that being said, we work with all farmers on this path of conservation. You as a farmer don't need to have conservation practices implemented, and you don't need to commit to change. You'd be joining to help understand what these practices mean financially, and putting yourself in a position to succeed if you ever needed to implement these practices. All right, Laura, you talked about programs. So I've got to ask, with all these different programs that are out there and different opportunities, sometimes we hear something called practice standards. And a lot of times that is in reference to NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Services, and their 
their standard, their idea of the gold standard of applying or doing something. So can you speak to like, what does that mean? What should a farmer know if they see the word or the phrase practice standards and how that could be interpreted? Absolutely. That's a big one that can catch a lot of people off guard is signing up for these programs and getting cost share sounds great. But a lot of these programs have certain rules we have to fi- follow on timing of when we plant, on when we terminate, on what we plant, what rates, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to always make sure you have that information up front. As someone who deals with this on a daily basis, there are so many different programs out here that have different rules. Even I can't keep up with them. So I always encourage everybody, once you work with your advisor, you make that plan run that plan back by the person who is ultimately in charge of administering the program that you work with so that you know you're going to get paid and not be caught off guard by not meeting the standards. But what you're talking about, the most common standard that's out there, both for NRCS and government funded programs, but that a lot of privately funded programs follow as well, is the NRCS standards. And for NRCS in Illinois, that means going off Midwest Cover Crop Council recommendations. So Midwest Cover Crop Council is a group that has developed a lot of recommendations tailored down to the county level on timings, rates, and appropriate cover crops. It lets you go in. It's a great tool. It lets you go in, kind of tell it what your goals are, and then it makes some cover crop suggestions. The problem is that that tool is very black and white and doesn't offer a lot of flexibility. And as folks in agriculture, we know that we need flexibility based on the variables we're facing that year. For instance, it's early May here in Illinois, and in my area, we don't have a lot of crop in the ground. Now, that's not to say we're too late or anything like that, but if we plant a little late, all of a sudden we have our herbicides out there a little later, we likely harvest a little later. Well, the cutoff dates on a tool like that don't change. And if Mother Nature's working well in the fall, we have moisture, we have good temperatures, we we would love to have some flexibility to be able to extend past that. So. Sometimes those recommendations can catch us off guard and to comply with a program, we're forced into putting the seed out there in a manner that probably isn't what we would do if we weren't trying to capture those cost shares. This has been another episode of Illinois Corn TV, where we deliver insightful ag interviews, positioning farmers to grow. Stay tuned for more content every week and be sure to subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next week.